Looks like we are up and running for recording. All right. We are ready to go. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and check your audio. If you are experiencing any audio trouble or you don't have a headset or speakers, you can call in by phone. And I'm going to go ahead and put that information into the chat for you. It is there on the screen right now, but let me put it in the chat for you also. Okay, so hopefully that went out to everyone. And I'd like to welcome you all to the first webinar of the 2018 IGNIS season. We are thrilled to have you join us for our fifth year of IGNIS. I cannot believe I've been doing this with you all for five years, so um, kind of cool. Uh, just as a reminder, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite. And that's exactly what we are hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity and <coughs> spark your intellect. This webinar series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and my partner in crime, Mark Carbon. And we'll go ahead and share our contact information with you at the end of the webinar in case you have any questions. Just advance our slide here. Our topic today is how to engage students using authentic assessment. And we are welcoming back Kelly Musen as our kickoff presenter for his third year in a row. So thank you so much, Kelly, for joining us again today to share your knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. So um, I think we're starting a trend here of having you as our kickoff speaker. So no pressure for next year, but you better get started on your presentation. All right. Um, please note that all of our webinars are captioned, and I'd like to thank ACS for their real-time captioning services. And I'm going to put the link to the captions into the chat for you. So let me go ahead and do that. So those are in there. So you can, um, oops, that is the phone number again. My bad. Having some trouble copying and pasting from Google today, I guess. Here we go. It's a stream text link. It's um, http colon slash slash www.streamtext.net slash player question mark event equals SBCTC in all caps. And then I'm also going to give you a link to the WebEx shortcuts for um, the keyboard just in case. Um, you might want to use any of those. Um, WebEx has an online um, help area that has a page for those. Okay, moving on. This webinar will be recorded, and you can access the recording links on the ATL blog. And I'm going to give you that link as well. So sorry for all the links, but lots of resources to share. And um, basically, um, this link that I just pasted in will take you right to the recording and resources menu item. And um, there's a whole section on the blog dedicated to uh, Ignis. And I'm also going to give you this next link here is the link to the full webinar schedule. So um, if you want to look and see what's coming next, uh, you, can, you can check there for our lineup for this season. We have switched web conferencing tools this year, so we're going to get started with just a very, very brief overview of the meeting interface, and then I'm going to hand it over to Mark to officially introduce Kelly. You can find the list of participants and the participant tools in the participants panel near the top right of your screen. And um, I'd like to ask you to please type your comments and questions into the chat panel that's near the bottom right of your screen as we go. Or you can raise your hand and ask a question. Um, we will come back to anything in the chat at the end. We will have some Q&A. But um, Kelly's usually pretty flexible. So if you need to ask a question during, I'm sure that would be all right, too. Uh, one thing to note on the chat is be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu when you're sending a message so it doesn't come to just me as the host privately. And then um, if you'd like to enter full screen, if you're having a hard time um, seeing the slides, um, there's some little expansion arrows that you can click near the top middle of your screen to enter into the full screen mode. And if you need some WebEx help, there is also um, a help link in the menu options near the top middle of your screen. 
And if you do get into full screen and you get stuck there and would like to get out of full screen to exit, um, just use the escape key on your keyboard or you can click on the return key that's on the pop down menu. If you just hover um, near the top of your screen, that menu will pop down for you and then you can click on the return key and it will take you back to the WebEx interface. And also, um, please raise your hand um, to speak and use the microphone icon to mute and unmute your mic. We'll call on you as you raise your hand. And um, make sure to keep your mics muted so we don't get your background noise. And that's the slide that went with what I was just talking about. Sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark now to introduce Kelly. And um, while Mark's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and switch over and bring up Kelly's slides so we can get ready to go. All right, Mark, take it away. Oh, thank you, Alyssa. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I get to introduce our wonderful lead loft every year. So I think it's now we're going to be required to be Kelly. It's, it's appreciated. So Kelly comes from us from uh, Clover Park Technical College working with him with, for many years and uh, does a great job down there. Um, he's the e-learning coordinator, but as a lot of them are assistant, he wears most movie hats. And so he is, uh, he provides the professional development for the faculty, specifically the areas of uh, pedagogy, learning outcome development, management, and assessment. Um, Kelly is also a uh, Canvas community coach with instructors. And he uh, also is part of the Washington State eLearning Council as well. And Kelly's been teaching online since 1999. And I've been pretty much working with him ever since then. <laughs> and uh, he continued his studies of online pedagogy with a strong focus on universal design for learning, open educational resources, accessibility and assessment. So thank you, Kelly, and take it away. Um, Kelly, just before you get started, um, I've lost you in the participant panel, so if you want to go ahead and grab the presenter ball and move it to yourself, since I can't find you right now, so you can control your slides. Um, yeah, it's not letting me move it. It's not letting you move it. Okay. I'll see if I can find you in here. Just you popped down to the bottom of the list. I wasn't expecting oh. expecting that. So you go ahead and start talking. I'll advance the slides for you, and um, I'll try to figure it out as we go. Okay. Okay. That's that sounds perfectly. Backup good. plan. <laughs> um, yeah. We, Alyssa and I are both brand new to WebEx, and we played a little bit earlier this week, but uh, obviously there's plenty for us to learn. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction, Mark, and thank you for not broaching my memory challenges and my dotage. Um, I'll just consider it a win if I don't trail off and start talking to myself today. Um, Alyssa, could you change the slide? Well, guess what? I figured it out while you were talking, so um, you're, you can so, do it by your big self. <laughs> all righty. Here's my agenda. It's not particularly important, and... Um, I'm not going to spend much time on it because an hour is short and we want to leave some time for questions at the end, but we're going to have a little general discussion of assessment, um, the steps to develop a well-aligned authentic assessment strategy, and how Canvas can help. Um, obviously, I'm talking about assessment today, and that's not a big surprise judging from the title of the presentation. But for many people, assessment can actually be a very bad word. Uh, I immediately think of the K-12 system where most schools are mandated by state law to assess student achievement of standards that are also mandated by state law. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. And we're not much better off in higher ed where we are mandated by our regional accrediting bodies to engage in program assessment. And for many of our programs, our out comes are mandated by somebody or other, including state agencies or articulation agreements with four-year schools. And it's one of the hats I wear over here at Clover Park, but I'm not going to talk about that kind of assessment either. What I am going to talk about is assessment of student learning in the classroom, and more specifically, authentic assessment. And while some of my focus will be on online courses, 
a good assessment practice works in any course regardless of the delivery modality. Um, I'm happy to report that a good assessment strategy at the classroom level also contributes to accomplishing program assessment requirements of our accrediting bodies, our program improvement, our course improvement activities, and almost everything else, but most importantly, can help keep our students engaged. And, um, speaking of our students, for no group of people is assessment a worse word than it is for our, our students. Too many students are apprehensive about assessment, some to the extent of outright fear, and for many, that fear is so strong that they actually need testing accommodations. And unfortunately, for far too many of our students, their first assessment experience in our classrooms may be their last, and we've lost them to their, our school, and they've lost their education opportunity. So why should we care? Well, we need to care about assessment for many reasons, and I've covered quite a few of them here, but my focus today is on how a good assessment strategy can actually improve student engagement. And among other things, we understand that engagement leads to persistence, and persistence fosters retention and often results in successful completion, and so that's why we should care about uh, assessment. And then finally today, I'll probably bore you to death with a, a whole lot of opinions because as an old man, I seem to have have uh, developed a few of those over the years as uh, Lissa and Mark and Wallet passed. Um, um, another quick note before we move on is don't expect any artsy images, videos of cute kittens or tricky PowerPoint anima animations in this slideshow. Um, I build for accessibility and uh, maybe next year that's what I'll talk about. So. I have a poll question. Let's see if I set that slide up right. Come on, slide change. Ah, there we go. Um, just through a show of hands, because the poll feature in WebEx isn't great, how many of you already use authentic assessments or are at least familiar with the concept of authentic assessment? <clears throat> Wow, um, I can't really tell from my end. Maybe Alyssa can verify, but I don't see very many hands up. I've got um, just a handful of hands. Great. Um, so three or four. I'm hoping that a few of you are familiar, but I I was really hoping that it wasn't a whole bunch of you, because uh, then you might start disagreeing with me and mumbling bad things about me. So. Um, I that, think you got your wish. Yeah, I, I, I'm <laughs> glad, you know, because um, I don't feel like an expert on most anything anymore. But uh, <clears throat> before I started talking about this, assessment, I just would like to share a student quote. Uh, I never thought I could learn so much. I got this quote at the end of the fall term. Um, I typically get a quote similar to this almost every term. And I almost always get it from students who started out in the bottom 20% of my course at the start of the term. Um, students who uh, didn't think they could learn online, uh, aren't particularly confident about learning. Um, students who, for the most part, think that assessment is a bad word. Um, so for a teacher, you know, hearing something like this from a student is truly the sprinkles on top of the frosting on top of the cake. And while I'm absolutely certain there are many other uh, factors that help this student learn, including her own determination and hard work, I think that my assessment strategy contributed to that. We all teach in higher education in here, or we participate in higher higher education in some form or another, and that means that unlike K-12, our students actually want to be here for the most part. They came here to learn something, uh, even if they're taking the um, prerequisite general ed courses that they all have to take before they can enter a program of study. 
they recognize that those gen ed courses or those remedial courses are going to help them reach their goal. So they're, they want to be here. The unfortunate thing is that um, they also start out with a lot of trepidation and um, good or bad assessment can play a huge role in whether or not those students become engaged and lose that trep trepidation throughout their academic career. Um, so let's go look at how we, let's start looking at assessment and how we can make it better. This is my own definition of assessment. It's uh, been synthesized from many, many different definitions of assessment. And for me, assessments are any tool or process used to measure learner achievement of stated learning outcomes or objectives. And we're not going to get into that whole argument about whether they're outcomes or objectives. Uh, we don't have time for that today. Um, I'd like to, before I move on to authentic assessment, here's an interesting observation. I think that most of our students, and especially the older ones, have no idea what that word assessment means, and yet in higher ed and probably in K-12, we use that term all the time. So here's my first tip. In your orientations in your classrooms, whether it's online or face-to-face, Tell your students what assessment means. And tell them in your own words because you'll be able to make it make better sense and connect with your students. Uh, you can use my own definition, make up your own, synthesize from other sources, whatever. But always be sure to include that part that an assessment is a measure of stated learning outcomes piece. Um, and here's my second tip. For any activity used as an assessment in your course, include what learning outcomes that activity is me meant to measure the achievement of. Uh, this is very important for your students, and they know from your outcomes what they're expected to learn, and they know that you've told them, I'm going to measure whether or not you met these outcomes using these assessment tools. And that's a very important piece for keeping your students engaged in the course. Um, I have three definitions of authentic assessment here. I'll let you guys read it. They're from Mueller, Wiggins, and Stiggins, and I just love rhyming names. But um, these greatly support my own thoughts on authentic assessment, except, um, come on, slide. I must have a um, delay in sc the screen transitioning. Um, but it's missing the most important part of any definition of assessment. I'm trying to get my slide to change, and we'll just, I'll just keep talking and pretend it has. I don't Kelly, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, try to change that okay, for you. Okay, if you can change that yep. for me. The piece that I don't see in those definitions of authentic assessment is that uh, learning outcomes or objectives aren't mentioned anywhere in them. And for authentic assessment, we want to expect our students to be able to demonstrate. We should expect them to demonstrate at whatever level in a taxonomy that is appropriate. And what we want them to demonstrate is that they know or can do what the stated learning outcomes tell them they should know or be able to do. And just like every other form of assessment, an authentic assessment can be both formative and summative. Um, what I want to point out too is if you've read about uh, authentic assessment in the literature, you're going to find that a lot of times the experts on authentic assessment are detractors of what they so quaintly call traditional assessment. And I hope you hear that cultured sneer in my voice. Um, you know, your typical multiple guess, matching short answers, et cetera, types of test. The reality is that whatever kind of assessment activity it is, if it does what it's supposed to do, measure student achievement of stated learning outcomes, 
then it's an authentic assessment. And in many cases, what we consider to be a, a traditional assessment can be very authentic depending on the outcomes that it's measuring and depending on the structure of your course. Um, oh, I, that slide changed. Uh, good, it actually worked for me. No, it, I'm doing it for you. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so just prompt me when you're ready to go to the next one. All righty. Um, what does authentic assessment look like? Well, it's a form of an assessment that in which students are asked to perform real-world tasks that demonstrate meaningful application of essential knowledge and skills. Um, to use a really silly example, um, if I had to choose a chauffeur to drive me to my next concert, uh, because I'm such a rock star, of course, um, would I choose one who only passed the written portion of the driving test? Or would I choose one that only passed the driving portion of the driving test in the state of Washington? Well, actually, I got to tell you, my choice would be to choose somebody who passed both halves of a driving examination. Not only did they, could they physically demonstrate the ability to drive a car, but by having passed the written test, they could drive that car safely and obey the rules of the road and not kill me along the way. So um, that's a good example of how a traditional test, because you know, our written driving tests, those are multiple choice, but they do measure our understanding of the rules of the road. So if I were to use nothing but traditional tests in my courses, um, my course, I teach medical terminology for two colleges in our system. We used to teach a lot of other things. Uh, but mostly, my, it's, a, it's a memorization course. My students need to be able to remember how to define medical terms, um, pronounce those medical terms, spell those medical terms, etc. And for a lot of those skills, they're, um, they, they can be demonstrated in a traditional assessment. But I also need my students to be able to pronounce those terms, be able to recognize those terms and apply them when somebody else pronounces them for them. So if I were to use nothing but traditional tests in my own courses, I wouldn't and couldn't measure student achievement of many of my outcomes that are beyond the memorization level. So next slide, please. Oh, you have it, defining options. Ah, I'm on a different slide. Okay, that's all right. Um, I'm going to back up just a pace here, and, and uh, Alyssa, you don't need to back up the slide. Uh, what does authentic assessment look like? Well, that's easy. It could be a multiple choice exam, an essay writing an assignment, a speech or a slideshow, a patient assessment, a business plan, Anything, and the closer to the real life activity, the better. So let's look at the defining attributes of authentic assessment. Typically, performing a task. The task you ask your students to perform should be tasks that demonstrate the level of achievement of the outcomes, whether recalling and defining a term in my own example or building some sort of contraption in the advanced contraptions program. They should be real life. My real life example for my own courses would be asking my students to, to define medical terms that are used in medical reports, journal, journal articles, um, professional websites on the internet. Uh, but an automotive technology program, it might be rebuilding a carburetor. That might be the real life example. It should be a construction or an application, and that can be accomplished by asking the students to do something to demonstrate skills like researching a medical diagnosis and treatment options, or recording patient vital signs, or any number of things. The only limitation, of course, is your own imagination. And as we've all learned from the uh, great Google, examples can be found easily. 
Authentic assessment should be student-centered. This one is so easy. What can students demonstrate that the students know or can do? And the actual act of demonstrating helps giving the students an opportunity to demonstrate, helps keep them engaged. And I also read that attribute as an opportunity to let students choose how they demonstrate or apply what they know or can do. Authentic assessments can allow more student choice and construction in determining what is presented as evidence of proficiency. Even when students cannot choose their own topics or formats, there is usually uh, multiple acceptable routes towards constructing a product or performing a task that still answers that question, have they achieved the learning outcome? Um, I have a really good example from our automotive program that I was going to present later in the slide, but um, our auto restoration program, um, the students have a final project where they restore a auto body, of course, you know, pound out the dance, sand it and grind it and put uh, the undercoats and the overcoats and the lacquers, finishes and everything else on there. Um, but what's to say those same students couldn't choose to do that same activity for a trailer or a motorhome or a pedal bicycle or a red flyer wagon um, and I chose automotive because we do have a real life example um, several years ago for their final project our auto restoration students chose to completely restore an antique Schwinn bike for their instructor and I gotta tell you it turned out marvelously and they clearly demonstrated that they met the outcomes of that program and the course that that project was in. Uh, direct evidence. Authentic assessment should provide direct evidence that the students have achieved an outcome. Poorly designed traditional assessments can often only provide indirect evidence, you know, those multiple choice questions with the silly distractors. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that even a student who did not study, you know, somebody like me, knows that the 35th President of the United States was not Mickey Mouse. And yet I'm also sure that we've all seen examples of distractors in multiple choice tests pretty close to that, if not sillier sometimes. So let's just talk a little bit about formative and summative assessments. If you could slide me over. Um, a formative assessment is used by learners for self-measurement of achievement. They're practice tests. We do them a lot. But formative assessments are also used by teachers to measure student learning, how well are my students doing on the practice uh, activities that I'm providing, how often are they engaging in the practice activities, is there a correlation with how often they're engaging in them and how well they're doing on the summative activities that I have in my classrooms. Formative assessments also measure the effectiveness of instruction and the instructional materials and activities that we include in our class. And they're really a good key indicator of areas in which students might be struggling. And if you use lots of formative assessments, they can indicate where there are problems before the students actually get to the stage of a of a high stakes summative assessment and maybe you can adjust the delivery of instruction, the instructional materials, the instructional activities, even just sending out the communication that clarifies a point that students are sticking on. Summative assessment, that's easy. It's used for determining a grade. But here's a, another one of those observations and I'll, I staged it as a question. Is there really a difference between formative and summative assessments? There's definitely not a difference in the fact that they are both tools for measuring student achievement of an outcome. And the only real difference is we use those summative assessments for determining a grade. But I've got to tell you, I know a lot of examples of faculty 
who are not using summative assessments at all for determining grades. They're using formative activities in a collective way to determine a student's grade. So let's move to the next slide. The goals of assessment. Um, I put this list in order of importance for me. You know, since it's uh, part of my job, I have to consider that final bullet point, you know, satisfy internal and external stakeholders. Um, we just became a guided pathway school, so um, assessment's going to play a huge role in that. But to me, um, anything that has to do with compliance, regulations, et cetera, et cetera, is always at the bottom of my list. The very first goal of assessment is to help students learn and provide them with an opportunity to demonstrate their learning. Assessments measure learner achievement of the outcomes, and it measures it for both the students, the teachers, and other stakeholders. And assessment can help faculty determine grades, improve their curriculum, and their instructional delivery, all part of this program assessment that all of the colleges in this state have to go to. So let's go change slides here. I think I have a poll question coming up. Um, one of the things that's very disengaging for students is the practice of um, very few assessments and the few that are included being high stakes assessments. How many of you depend on or are required to use high stakes assessments in your courses? And by high stakes, I mean um, a midterm and final exam, and you're mandated by your program that those assessments account for 40% of a student's grades. How many of you in, are in that position or choose to be in that position? Give me a show of hands, and I'll let Alyssa tell me where the vote came in. Well, right now we only have one hand up, so. Um, looks wow. like, yeah. Excellent. Um, I mean, I, I was hoping for more, actually, because we see a, the use of a lot of high stakes assessments in, in higher education. And maybe that trend is starting to uh, fall apart. I work for a, a technical college. And for many of our programs, our curriculum is somewhat mandated by outside agencies, for example. Our nursing program, their requirements are set, set by the state nursing board, and they're required to use high stakes assessments. And those assessments have to count for a specified percentage of a student's grade, which can be huge. So, uh, and I teach for healthcare programs for my medical terminology courses, and I'm required to use a final, and my final is required to account for 40% of my students' grades. And this can be very disengaging for a student to, you know, know that they've spent 10 weeks or 11 weeks working through the materials in the, in the course and they're doing fairly well. Um, whatever little graded activities have been included, they've done fairly well on them. And then all of a sudden in the final week of the term, they're expected to suddenly be able to remember everything. And the better of us will provide a review period and some review materials for our students. But, you know, typically those are made available just before the high stakes exam. And that forces the students to cram everything at the last minute. Um, even your more prepared students are going to be cramming. And we, I think we all understand that when you cram, you're not really going to have any sort of long-term memory. And I teach in healthcare, so the stuff that um, I'm teaching my students, I want them to remember it throughout the rest of their academic career when they're in their actual healthcare programs. And I would really like them to be able to remember that when they go out and work in the industry because, you know, I'm old, they may be providing health care to me at some point, and so I hope they remember all of this important stuff. So a lot of us don't have a choice but to use high-stake exams. But 
um, a good assessment strategy and a strong use of formative assessments throughout the term can actually prepare students for those high stakes exams and set them up to succeed in them um, and, and set them up to not fear them, uh, to be able to walk into them thinking that, uh, assured that they know what they're, they know and that they're going to do well. Um, hopefully as we look at assessment strategies in part two, uh, I'll be able to demonstrate this to you. So next slide. Oh, where'd that slide come from? Oh, what activities can be considered assessments? Oh, okay. I that was the next slide, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, um, I watch the screen too much and not my notes enough, I guess. So of course, test quizzes and exams, oh my. Discussion forums, I use a lot of those for assessment. Blogs, social media, any assignment, homework, worksheets, etc. Any writing activity from grammatical diagramming to full-blown essays, short stories, doctoral dissertations are an assessment. Um, but coding a program, restoring a car, repairing a television, injecting a medicine, styling hair, welding a pipe together, recording audio or video, performing an interview, capstone projects, group works, etc., etc., etc. I hope I made that point clear that everything can and does measure student achievement if you set it up that way in your classrooms. So don't let yourself think of assessment only as a quiz, a test, an exam, a final project, a capstone essay. Think of it as every opportunity that you provide your students throughout the term to demonstrate their learning to both themselves and to you as the instructor. All right, next slide. So how many of you understand the concept of curriculum alignment or are familiar with it? Uh, go ahead again and raise your hands and I'll give a couple minutes here. And I, I see Claver, he's got his camera on, he's moving over to click something on the screen. Yeah, lots of hands going up. Lots of hands. And this, yeah. is, this is good. Um, go ahead and, and, and switch the slide. This is, this is actually very good because this is incredibly important. Um, essentially, alignment means that all the course components work together to support achievement of the stated learning account outcomes and that all assessments measure the achievement of those learning outcomes. Quality Matters is very big in our state community and technical college system, so it doesn't surprise me that a lot of you were familiar with alignment because it's, it's um, a key component of the Quality Matters rubric and standards. Um, there's really no way we can talk about assessment without talking about curricular alignment. Without alignment, we may not be teaching our students what we said they would learn. And we are likely not accurately measuring their achievement of what we told them they would learn. And without alignment, we can struggle to develop authentic assessments and determine their accuracy and validity, both of which are very important because we do want to measure exactly what we told our students that they would learn. And we want to provide materials and activities and instruction that helps them learn those things. So what this means essentially is that if we have learning outcomes A, B, and C, then all lear learning materials and activities directly support the achievement of outcomes A, B, and C, and all assessments achieve, uh, measure the level of achievement of outcomes A, B, and C. Very simple concept, very powerful one, and um, since most of you are familiar with alignment, um, I'm going to skip a whole bunch on this slide because I see I'm using up a lot of time and just mention that a well-aligned curriculum helps us develop our assessment strategies and our assessments that are both, that both authentic and measure student achievement of our outcomes. So, and there's nothing that disengages our students more than uh, being measured for something that they weren't taught or not being measured for things that they were taught. 
Um, so summary of part one, um, I'll let you guys read the, the bullets, but I'm just sitting here wondering, you know, that's the five simple bullets. I don't know why I couldn't have just read those bullets in the first place and move us on to part two and get you all out of here earlier. Um, let's move on to part two. The steps to develop a well-aligned authentic assessment. I put authentic in quotations because if I've already explained, any assessment can be authentic depending on what it's measuring and how it's measuring. And what do I mean by strategy? I mean all of the assessment activities, formative and summative, that comprise a learning unit, a course, or even a program. So let's look at the steps. Identify the desired outcomes, of course. Um, I think I've made that clear all the way through this, that you need to, ha your assessments should measure your student achievement of the outcomes. For each of those outcomes, a single outcome will have a skill set and a knowledge set that they are made up of. Often, um, especially at a program level, you're going to have many skills and many knowledge items that com are a component of that outcome. So identify those. Then identify the appropriate assessment strategy to measure whether the students have those skills or that knowledge. Then step four, develop those assessments or those tasks. And then step five, if the assessment is a task, develop a grading rubric to accompany that. Uh, go ahead and, and change to the next slide. I'm trying to, to make up time here. Um, this is just one way to do this, and this is the way I teach our faculty over here at uh, Clover Park to do it, and that's because I'm kind of OCD like my top 5% students. I find that a grid makes this really easy to do this, and the resulting grid not only does it help me develop my assessment strategy and my individual assessments, but it's also very useful for choosing learning materials and activities, for reviewing my curriculum to identify areas where I need to make improvement. And again, it's just a simple grid. In the far left column, I list the outcome. You know, and I'll use this uh, webinar as an example. Develop constructively aligned assessment strategies that accurately measure student achievement. Um, I listed out three quick knowledge items. I listed out three quick skills. And as my assessment strategy, and of course this is abbreviated to use as an example, um, for items one, two, and three, I can use a combination of one or more traditional assessments or even authentic assessments that demonstrate that students have a usable understanding of that knowledge. And then items four through six, assess the skills by asking the students to outline an assessment strategy and developing one or more assessments. And I actually stole this also out of uh, one of the courses that I teach our faculty. I use that same technique myself, and then I keep that documentation so that when it's time to review my courses, I know that I'm teaching them these knowledge, these sets of skills. Have any of my outcomes changed? Have any of the skills or knowledge expanded because of changes in industry, et cetera, et cetera? I don't ha get a lot of changes in industry being a medical terminology teacher because that's all Latin and Greek and 4,000 years old. But anyways, um, you can see how this tool can be used that way. Next slide. Some general uh, strategies. I already told you my first tip, define assessments for your students and tell them how you're going to assess their achievement of the outcomes. Generally, if it isn't stated in learning outcomes, don't measure it. Um, the, the best example here is attendance. Um, many, many of us either grant points for attendance or take points away from attend for not attending. And yes, I recognize that attendance can be very important, especially in professional and technical fields where you're trying to um, train students to a behavior that will um, make employers happy. But if attendance is that important to you, state it in your learning outcomes. Otherwise, don't measure it. 
Use frequent and varied assessments. I can't stress this a lot uh, uh, enough. Um, lots and lots of regularly scheduled assessments throughout any um, learning period. Um, make most of them formative. Make them low stakes or even extra credit. Um, I, I don't want to penalize my top 10% of my students for not engaging in the formative activities. And um, as far as the few extra points, I could care less about points because they're kind of arbitrary. And uh, so I use lots and lots of formative assessments. And I use lots of different kinds. Offer assessment choices. Again, let them restore an antique Schwinn bike. Um, let them hunt down their own website that talks about a diagnosis and a treatment options. You know, um, wherever possible, give them choice. Of course, use authentic assessment. Include lots of formative opportunities. And again, alignment, alignment, alignment. Make sure that you're measuring exactly what you told your students they would learn. Um, next one. Alyssa, um, try to write questions that test skill rather than recall. I know I'm in a memorization course, so I, I have to test recall. Um, but on this slide, I've um, actually recreated Bloom's revised taxonomy. I think we're all very familiar with this taxonomy. It's been in higher ed for 50, 60 years. Um, What's handy about using the taxonomy is that the same action verbs that you use to develop a learning outcome will um, guide the kinds of activities or assessment items that you're creating to measure whether or not your students are achieving those outcomes and also help you determine what kind of learning materials and activities you need in your course. So they're actually a great tool for maintaining alignment. So like knowledge, you know, um, it's listing and recalling. So list the steps involved in titration or label the major landmarks of the digestive system. Uh, for comprehension, you know, understanding facts and principles, et cetera. Uh, summarize the basic tenets of deconstructionism. Estimate the income tax for this married couple using the documents provided. Um, I'm, I'm using action verbs out of blooms. So to measure application, uh, you could do something like calculate the deflection of a wood beam under uniform loading. I bet half of you are wondering what in the heck am I talking about there? To measure analysis or recognition, uh, recognition of unstated assumptions or logical fallacies, um, you could have an activity that asks the students in, to analyze the president's State of the Union address and determine which statements are based on facts and which are based on assumptions. To measure evaluation, you know, comparing something to a standard. Um, Ask your students how they would restructure the school day to reflect children's developmental needs. To measure creation, um, ask the you know students to uh, create some entirely new idea or system or describe or di discriminate in, in systems. So ask them why is box mass and B minor acknowledged as a classic. And then if you're forced or inclined to offer a high stakes final exam, by using lots of varied assessments regularly throughout your term, um, they're low stakes. You repeat the concepts. You reinforce your um, learning outcomes. When they step into that high, steps, uh, high stakes test, they're much better prepared. Now, I'll tell you how I do this in my own courses. I have um, a series of, uh, I call them practice labs. They're Canvas quizzes. Um, 
they're usually rather extensive and they're set to be taken as often as they the students like and they don't count towards their final grade and the items in these are organized by anatomy physiology um, treatment options etc um, every item in those practice labs uh, points directly to a learning outcome in my course and those items are repeated several times and again the students can take those as often as they want and for each module I include a spelling quiz and a module exam and the items from my spelling quizzes and my module exams are taken straight from my practice labs and at the end of the term, my final exam, every item in my final exam is taken straight from my module spelling quizzes and module exams. So by the time students get to my final exam, they have seen every item at least two or three times and often more with various small assignments and things that I throw in there. So they're prepared when they get there. And do I know it works? Um, yeah, 68% of my students in fall quarter achieved in a, in a very rigorous course. So um, I, I, I think that it works. And um, I hope to hear back from some of you if you uh, do some of this that um, it's working for your students too. Now I have a third part. Let's go to that really quick. Um, how can Canvas help? Let's do a, another quick poll. Are all of you Canvas teachers? Hold up your hands. Let us know if you're Canvas teachers. And that will really help me know how far to go and how deep to go in this. What do you see, Alyssa? Uh, you've got um, Several hands up, almost everybody. I think there's just one or two okay. that don't have their hands up. All right, so I'm just going to talk about the Canvas tools really quick. I mean, we're all familiar with the quizzes, but they are incredibly flexible, and um, they have a variety of item types. The quizzes next to will have an even more item types. Um, you can make them not count towards a student's grade. You can make them count whatever kind of point scale you want. You can let students make multiple attempts. Um, in the new quizzes LTI that Canvas is coming out with very soon, they'll have stimulus items where you can have a, a, a page of text, an image, a video, something else, and have a set of questions associated with them. Great tool for both formative and summative assessments. Canvas discussions, I already mentioned that I use Canvas discussions very heavily in my course and I usually uh, use them to um, give my students an opportunity to apply what they've learned about medical terminology and demonstrate their understanding through conversations with their classmates. I send them on field trips, I have them I evaluate information, I ask them to express opinions and find supporting documentation and research, so lots. Canvas assignments, uh, with all the different submission possibilities in Canvas assignments and the fact that you can just create an assignment as a gradebook column, provides an incredible amount of flexibility for using them as an assessment tool, including using them as an assessment tool for something that is demonstrated in a physical classroom or at a clinical practicum site or while they're sanding the paint off of an old car. And then Canvas grading rubrics support that flexibility that's in uh, our assignments. Um, I have a cosmetology program that creates rubrics for observing students styling and cutting hair. And then the, um, our, the faculty will stand there with an iPad in their hand watching the students demonstrate their skill and just working their way down that rubric going tap, 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 tap. So that rubric is giving them an opportunity to objectively grade that student and give that student almost instant feedback on how well they did. Our nursing faculty do that same to assess students performing patient assessment or when observing clinical practice activities on site. Uh, watching a student repainting a car or baking chocolate chip cookies or delivering a self-reflective speech. 
all of these things you can use a canvas grading rubric to do use you know you don't have it doesn't have to be using a rubric to grade an essay that they popped into there anything can be a rubric can be applied to any I think I've seen rubrics with 40 50 60 or more criteria covering several stages of a product spanning seven you know several days or even weeks and still being able to provide you know almost instant feedback to students on authentic task so a well-aligned curriculum the students know what they uh, will be learning and how their learning will be measured through the use of lots of formative assessment opportunities they have ample opportunities to practice and measure their own learning and become better prepared for our high stakes exams and through the use of variety of assessment types and opportunities for choice they get opportunities to demonstrate their learning in a way that makes better sense to them and it really doesn't get more engaging than that so um, I'm going to open this up for questions So Kelly, we didn't have any questions come into the chat as you were talking, so you must have been very clear in what you were presenting. Um, but now would be a great time um, for anyone to share um, maybe one of their authentic assessment practices, um, maybe an idea for an activity that you'd like to share with the other participants, or to ask Kelly any questions um, about his presentation before we close out for the day. And I would love to hear examples. And feel free to um, raise your hand and take the mic, or just to go ahead and um, type your questions into the chat is fine as well. Alyssa, you um, took back the little ball that makes you present. Could you change to the next slide real quickly? Sure. Um, I provided some additional resources and um, Alyssa is going to make this slideshow and my full speaker notes available to the people who participated today um, but I wanted to note at the bottom of the additional resources I put my uh, work email address so um, you're welcome to email me and ask me anything just chat about assessment whatever I love to talk about assessment and I'm actually going to go ahead and I'll just put your contact information also directly into the chat for everyone uh, so they can snag it from there as well. All right. Doesn't look like um, we have any questions. We do have a comment. Uh, Kelly, thanks for your varied recommendations and for the authentic assessment toolbox. That was from Peg. So um, she's thanking you for sharing that. Well, that Authentic Assessment Toolbox is an awesome site. So Yeah, it's pretty cool. I've looked at it um, before, <laughs> so yeah. All right, um, shall I go ahead and close this out then since we don't have any questions? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, switch back to our slides. Um, from our introduction and I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we have another our second IGNIS um, for the 2018 season our second webinar is coming up on Thursday April 12th and um, that webinar will feature Stephanie Delaney uh, she's the Dean of Academic Programs at South Seattle College and she'll be talking to us about managing difficult conversations in the online classroom so please be sure to watch for announcements for that and um, join us um, in a few weeks. Uh, the webinars are on selected Thursdays throughout um, the fall and into early summer. So um, watch for us at the 2 p.m. time. And um, those um, announcements go out um, usually by email, and I also post them on the ATL blog, and um, I tweet about them as well. So um, watch for those. And then if you have any questions or co um, comments about the IGNIS series, please feel free to contact either myself or Mark. I'm acells at sbctc.edu, and Mark is mcarbon at sbctc.edu. And um, also feel free to follow up with Kelly should you have any additional questions about his presentation. And then um, just to sign off and say thank you to everyone. Thanks to our participants. Thanks to Kelly for presenting and opening 
us up and kicking us off for this year. And thanks to my co-host Mark for um, helping introduce Kelly. And um, one item of note is that Ignis is openly licensed, so all of the content, um, please feel free to take it, share it, revise it, use it for your own purposes, and um, then share it back out to the community uh, should you make any changes. So um, thanks again for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording now. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Mark.